Right, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, uh, this exciting uh, session of Meet the Expert. We've lined up two uh, uh, great speakers uh, uh, for you, uh, starting with um, a man who needs uh, no introduction, Professor Andrew Bolton. I think um, most of you um, know Professor Bolton, who is currently uh, the IDF uh, president, and as well as uh, he's the president of Euradia. Um, he is the past president of ESD. Um, uh, Professor Paulton graduated from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, and subsequently he, he trained in Sheffield and Miami uh, prior to accepting appointment in, at Manchester University. He authored more than 550 uh, high-index uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts. Um, his impact on diabetes, specifically diabetic food disease and diabetic renal disease, is uh, is beyond um, um, uh, my me describing it because everybody knows his uh, his imprint in this and uh, his interest in the, in in education as well is 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 well known. Uh, he has he was the founding chairman of the diabetic food study group as well as his his previous the chairman of the Bosch Graduate Education and then the honorary secretary of and the program chair of the ESD. Uh, Professor Bolton is is work in diabetes has been well recognized uh, throughout the world. Um, he was he received the ADA Roger Pecoraro lectureship as well the uh, Camilo Dolgi um, uh, prize from ESD. He also received uh, ADA Howard Griffin Award for, for distinguished international service in, di in diabetes. And in 2012, he received the Georgetown Distinguished Achievement Award for Diabetic Limbs, Limb Salvage. In 2015, he was recognized in Japan, in Nagoya in Japan, where he gave the lecture on diabetic complication at the Japan uh, Society for Diabetes. And in 2017, he was the Banting Memorial Lecturer in Diabetes UK. And he also received the International Diabetes Endocrinologist Award of the Year from the American Association of in Clinical Endocrinology. We are so privileged and very lucky to have him to talk to us about a very topical um, uh, thing uh, um, about diabetes and COVID-19. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much uh, for your generous introduction, Dr. Ismail. It's a pleasure to be with you the third day running at this conference, and I see that there's still a large number of people attending, which is very impressive on a Saturday evening. So I'll just start to remind you, not that you need reminding, about the global epidemic of diabetes. I can tell you that um, the next IDF Atlas will be launched in a couple of months, and sadly, the figures are going to be even higher, although I can't give you the actual figures because it's embargoed. But there are now more than half a billion people with diabetes across the world. And it's very high, particularly in countries uh, who are listening to this uh, session tonight. For example, my good friend Abdul Basit from Karachi uh, showed that the prevalence of diabetes in adults in Pakistan is now above 26 percent, which is very worrying. And I fear that the same is probably true in India. Uh, an older study here from Egypt showing the prevalence of diabetes uh, above 15.5% uh, some five or six years ago. So we have a major problem. Uh, these data will soon be surpassed, as I said, by the uh, 2021 IDF Atlas, but the predicted rises are very worrying, uh, particularly, for example, in your region, Middle East and North Africa, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a major problem. And even more so during the COVID pandemic, as I will show you, we really need to encourage good glycemic control because those who do badly are those who don't have good glycemic control when they present with COVID infections and those who have complications. This is uh, my good friend and editor of Diabetes Care, Matt Riddle and colleagues writing 
on really the world lessons for those with diabetes from the pandemic. This was written uh, towards the end of last year. Diabetes, they concluded, was not shown to increase the likelihood of infection, but the progression to more se severe disease to, was likely. Diabetes two to three times more common in those requiring intensive care treatment. And as I've already said, diabetes itself, obesity, late complications, and ethnicity are additive risk factors. So we need to continue to support vulnerable people, including those listed above. So I gave one of the best of ADA meetings, that's the ADA in uh, earlier this year, uh, lectures on the year uh, in review. Uh, and I was uh, able to listen to these lectures, uh, excellent lectures, and I've used, borrowed some of the slides with permission to talk firstly about the coronavirus and the beta cell. And this is uh, from the lecture given by Maureen Gannon, a basic scientist working in experimental diabetes. So she started by reviewing a number of papers. And this one here was published last year from Shooting Chen's group. All these groups are Americans. And they used the human pluripotent stem cell based platform to look at does the virus actually infect the beta cell? So these uh, authors actually showed that beta cells can be infected and there was increased expression of ACE protein receptor and those infected beta cells generated cytokines. But of course, this was a cell uh, cellular model and not from human pancreas. At about the same time, Mark uh, Al Power's group uh, in cell metabolism couldn't actually confirm those findings. And this was using sections from human pancreas so this was actually human practice, uh, pancreas, and they could not find it, increased expression of the A2 uh, in tissue sections. And a subsequent study from Mark Atkinson's group in uh, Florida uh, supported the data from Al Power's group. And they showed that ACE2 uh, protein receptor was not expressed in beta cells, but was expressed, for example, in the pancreatic ducts and the microvasculature. But then another paper, a follow-up paper, by, again, uh, Shubin Chen's group, again from the USA. This time in his group, uh, this was from human uh, pancreas, from autopsies. So they were able to detect the antigen in samples of beta cells and suggested that this leads to beta cell transdifferentiation and inflammation. So I would say now that the jury is out on whether there is a direct infection of the beta cells. And I would draw you to this nice review uh, in Nature uh, towards the end of last year, uh, really discussing the evidence. And they were leaning to the fact that coronavirus might indeed trigger diabetes by these mechanisms. Now, it was then my good friend, uh, Will Cephalou, who, who used to be editor of Diabetes Care, and I'm a senior associate editor on there, so I've worked with Will and, and Matt Riddle. And Will is now director of NIDDK at the NIH in, in Washington. So he talked about translational advances, and I'm going to return to COVID and his discussion there. But of course, he started by remembering that this is 100 years since the discovery of insulin. And indeed, it was this month, November 1921, that the first uh, dogs to receive insulin were shown that uh, they actually survived. And of course, there have been a lot of important discoveries in the second half of the last century. Um, many of you will remember the early studies of HbA1c, and this was only been available for, really for the last 40 years. In my first diabetic clinics, all we had was urinalysis and a random blood sugar. And then, of course, we had the DCCT, and this is looking at the US uh, studies, of course, uh, and then we had the DPP that you've heard of in the last talk. Of course, the studies from Finland and Jakob Toimilito and, and colleagues uh, preceded this, but showed very similar results. And most recently, we have potential treatments to prevent those at very high risk going on to develop type 1 diabetes. But he also discussed COVID-19 and diabetes. And I'll just talk about one uh, paper from the UK that he reviewed. And this was post-COVID syndromes in individuals admitted to hospital uh, in, with COVID-19. This was a retrospective cohort study uh, from uh, last year, published this year. 
So in this study, this was at all NHS hospitals in England, the authors quantified rates of organ-specific dysfunction in those individuals with COVID-19 after discharge from hospital and compared with a matched control group from the general population. So this was a large number of patients, but again, a retrospective cohort review, so that has its limitations. But nearly 87,000 people in hospital during the study period in 2020. Uh, about uh, 10,000 of those were admitted to ICU and 76,000 were not. And of course, they were looking at people post-discharge, so they had to exclude, uh, obviously, people who didn't survive. Uh, and there were other reasons for exclusion. But it's still a large cohort that was reviewed, just under 48,000 patients. And what they showed here was if you look at those with diabetes, they were much more likely to have adverse events after discharge. But more interestingly, perhaps, uh, those without diabetes were more likely to develop diabetes as a new onset event. So this study suggested that post-discharge event rates were greatest for those with diabetes and other people with major uh, adverse cardiovascular event history. Compared to similar in individuals from the general population, those discharged COVID patients had elevated rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease and liver disease. This cannot show cause because it's a retrospective study, but they do suggest that there might be a significant uh, statistical association that warrants further investigation. So let's look at some of the studies over the last year. And here's a study from uh, NHS England that was published in May, online, May last year. And this was a large study, a population cohort study of persons with diabetes registered in primary care in the UK. And the prevalence of diabetes amongst the 61 million uh, individuals was 5%. One in 20. Of course, the vast majority with type 2. But of the 23,800 COVID related deaths until May last year, one in three occurred in people with diabetes. 31% of all deaths were in those with type 2 diabetes and 1.5% in those with type 1. And there are the crude mortality rates, as you see, much higher compared with those without diabetes. Then they adjusted for age, sex, ethnicity, and deprivation and location. The odds of dying were still much in statistically increased in people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So further adjustment did attenuate somewhat, but still highly significantly increased risk. So diabetes shown in, clearly in this study, independently associated with an increased risk of in-hospital death. A study from New York published in the BMJ around the same time. This was a retrospective a electronic medical record chart review six weeks from March, which was it corresponded to the first uh, lockdown in the UK. Of a thousand patients seen at Columbia Hospital in New York, 850 were admitted and 236 required ICU treatment. Diabetes, obesity and hypertension were common, especially in those going to ICU. So these are the same in the USA and in the UK, adverse outcomes related, of course, to ICU admissions and other comorbidities. There were some nice reviews by Liz Selvin, who is an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore, in diabetes care towards the end of last year. And some questions were asked. First of all, is diabetes itself a risk factor for, sorry, that should be for, not all, COVID-19? Certain infections, of course, we know are more common in diabetes, but she couldn't conclude that diabetes itself was a direct risk factor for COVID-19 infection, as pointed out by Riddle in the paper I reviewed earlier. But inequities in healthcare, poverty, poor housing, ethnicity, etc., might contribute to this perception. In the same paper, she asked us, diabetes independently contribute to poorer outcomes in hospital. Of course, diabetes occurs in older people and more likely to have comorbidities. And they said she concluded that there's no definite evidence to support that diabetes itself leads to poorer outcomes, but other associated factors, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, renal complications may be driving worse outcomes, uh, hence the, the higher mortality in diabetes. And she also questioned the role of obesity. And she concluded there was indeed evidence that obesity is an important risk factor for progression and death. This may relate to ventilation. 
the obese patient, of course, with reduced residual lung capacity. Obesity may play a direct role by inflammatory pathways or biological effects, for example, on uh, epicardial adipose tissue. We don't know. What about the lessons for people with diabetes or for diabetes? And this is a review by Partha Carr uh, from the UK. And he said, we need to have parity of focus on all types of diabetes. And we mustn't forget diabetes during this pandemic because these patients are undoubtedly, if they're hospitalized, uh, of risk of poorer outcomes for the reasons we've discussed. Here is uh, Fiona Godley, editor of the, the, the British Medical Journal, uh, writing here in uh, about the middle of last year, that the, saying that the pandemic has led to a neglect of many conditions. Cancer care and heart disease were brought out, but sadly not diabetes. And we certainly need, and I'm sure everywhere in the world, and the Emirates will be no exception, uh, to really tackle the backlog of non-COVID treatments. And positive improvements must be maintained, reduce bureaucracy, has been thrust upon us because we have to act fast, video consultations and so on. Again, evidence came from studies and, and sadly we in the UK cannot be proud of our record with COVID, one of the highest uh, numbers per 100,000 in the developed world uh, of cases, although our vaccination rates are now very high. And I'm pleased to say that I got my third shot of the booster just this week. But here was a trial of dexamethasone in severely ill ICU patients treated in the UK. And it may be its potential could be used in managing the cytokine storm that occurs, we know, with severe COVID infection. And in those patients requiring oxygen or ventilation, this is a randomized control trial, a randomized trial of dexamethasone, six milligrams daily for four for 10 days versus standard of care. A large number of centers. 2,000 patients approximately received dexamethasone, 4,000 standard of care. But for those on ventilators treated with dexamethasone, the death rate reduced from 40 to 28%. From those on oxygen and not on the ventilator, 25 to 20%. So look at this, the number needed to treat, to so save one life, approximately eight. On oxygen, 20. And this is not an expensive drug. Uh, it costs the equivalent of about, what, 20, 25 dirhams a, a, a day, which is very low considering some of the drugs that are being used. And I couldn't help to be amused listening to our good friends uh, Trump and jo um, Johnson asking if this drug was actually yet available in the, our countries, uh, which uh, entertained me a little. But I have to say those two gentlemen don't often entertain me. So here are some more recent studies in, in diabetes care. We've run a number of issues this year with uh, bringing papers together on the COVID-19 and diabetes. Here's a study of early glycemic control after hospital admission in people with COVID-19. 548 patients of whom just under one in five had diabetes, looking at daily fasting blood glucose. 39% developed ARDS, 11% died. Those with higher mean fasting blood glucose uh, were older in this week one, longer inpatient stay, and an increased risk of severe illness and death. And higher blood glucose fluctuation was associated again with uh, more severe disease and death. This is a smaller study because this was looking at continuous glucose monitoring. 35 patients with COVID-19 diabetes were monitored with CGM. And they looked, these authors looked at time in range, time above and time below range. And the time above range was associated with adverse outcomes and time above, below uh, range and higher coefficient of variation or fluctuation were also associated with poorer outcomes. Many lessons here. And here's a study looking at diabetes and obese overweight. Again, looking at the risk of uh, adverse outcomes in COVID. 7,000 plus hospitalized patients with a multinational study, 65% were overweight or obese. The overweight were more likely to need oxygen and ventilation, but no increase in mortality. Diabetes, no increased risk of adverse outcome over BMI related risk. But overweight, therefore, as well as obesity and diabetes are associated with the need for respiratory support, but not in this study for mortality. 
is a national study, again, in one of these issues of diabetes care this year, looking at patients in the UK requiring uh, critical care management. 19,000 admitted to intensive care. Again, 18,000, 18% rather, type 2 diabetes with a 26% mortality. Type 2 diabetes in this study, a risk factor for mortality and also associated with diabetes with younger age. So there are many threats to people with diabetes during this pandemic. Those who have had to shield, and this is a miserable existence during our lockdowns, people with diabetes were told, really stay at home. This leads to poorer diet, difficulties with exercise, poorer glycemic control. But not only that, the psychological impact is immense. These people became frightened of coming to hospitals. And therefore, attendances at hospital-based clinics fell rapidly. So worried was I about this that I moved all my patients with diabetic complications that I see, mainly foot and neuropathy, away to a community clinic. And that increased the attendance at the clinics from about 50% to nearly 100%. So there's this psychological impact which adversely affects glycemic control and poorer glycemic control leads to poorer outcome. We fear that there might be a tsunami of complications after this is over because of the poor control during this period of time. But we must also embrace the opportunities, the expansion of telemedicine. Digital education programs are available. Patients can look at these online. Improvements in inpatient diabetes services are being thrust upon us and re redesign. So there are threats during the lockdowns. We had cancellation of all routine outpatient clinics. There might be problems with access to medicine and supply chains, suspension of all routine investigations. We weren't allowed, uh, even with patients with foot ulcers, to do a routine foot x-ray, for example. Suspension of all non-emergency surgery occurred and during the lockdowns we have had and transplant surgery, which is so important for those people with end-stage renal disease the best state treatment for diabetic nephropathy is prevention. The second best, if you've got it, is transplantation. So we could say there is a threat here of a double whammy. First of all, clinical research may swing back to infectious diseases and a loss of income for major diabetes associations because people are more likely to give to cancer, to infectious diseases, to studies into COVID and so on. But also clinical diabetes care has been suffering throughout the pandemic and this fear of hospital clinics leading to poor attendance. So there are threats and potential solutions, collaboration between stakeholders of major interests in non-communicable diseases, pharma partners, increased global awareness of diabetes is so important as a life-threatening condition, and the message to our politicians, wherever we are, whatever nation we is, is that diabetes is so important and so potentially preventable if screened for in high-risk populations. So I'll end there and remind you uh, again that we have our IDF Virtual Congress this December. Please do register and join it. We have a dedicated stream on, a stream on COVID-19 and diabetes. We also have the launch on the first day of the IDF 10th edition of the Atlas and a symposium to celebrate 100 years of insulin. So with that, I say shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bolton, for this very informative uh, and um, very nice presentation that uh, carried many points to ponder about. Uh, well, I'm sure this will generate many questions in the Q&A uh, session. I'll be grateful if you could stick around for this session. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we'll now move to the second session. Um, Professor Jason Gill, um, I think his... Uh, He's well known to me because of uh, um, he will be he will be quite wondering because of BBC Two Horizon. <laughs> he's he's sort of uh, he's sort of uh, um, a TV celebrity in in UK. Um, uh, professor Gill is a cardiometabolic health in, um, uh, professor in the Institute of Cardiovascular and uh, Metabolic Science in the University of uh, Glasgow in uh, Scotland. Um, he is professor of uh, cardiometabolic health, and his interest uh, uh, centers around multidisciplinary approaches and research, uh, leading a, a very active research group 
uh, trying to investigate the effect of lifestyle on the prevention and management of vas vascular and metabolic diseases. He works, his work includes studies into epidemiology of lifestyle and cardiometabolic diseases, risk particularly, why certain populations, uh, certainly ethnic, certain ethnic groups uh, are um, at high risk of cardiac uh, disease. Um, he was quite influential in, uh, in the UK physical activity guidelines, NICE guidelines, sign guidelines as well. Um, being the bus chair of uh, the association, uh, the British Association of Sport and Exercise uh, Science, I'm sure he's uh, well placed to talk to us about uh, physical activity and health. How much is needed and does one size fit all? Professor Gill, the floor is yours. I'm delighted to be here to talk about one of my one of my favorite topics, which is physical activity. Um, and I, I've titled my talk Physical Activity and Health. Um, how much is needed and, and does one size fit all? So we start off with the question, how much physical activity do we need to do? But I think when people ask that question, what they're often really asking is this question. How little physical activity can we get away with? Um, and to, to do that, we need to look at the um, dose-response relationship for physical activity and risk of adverse health outcomes. So this is a slide with real data. I've taken the numbers off, um, showing um, data from a number of epidemiological studies looking at risk of mortality on the y-axis and the amount of physical activity people do on the x-axis. And what you can see here is uh, one of my roles is as um, writing physical activity guidelines. Where do you draw the line on that graph? There's no obvious single best amount of activity to do. And the point where we draw the line is about there. Um, and that's the, that's the real data behind it. Um, so what we've got here is risk of mortality and the amount of physical activity you do. And, and a few things to bear in mind is there's, there's no minimum threshold for benefit. So from doing nothing to doing something, you actually get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of improving physical activity. And if you're up at this part of the dose response relationship, um, if you're doing an hour of running a day and moving to two hours per day, you actually get a, a much smaller um, in, um, 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 a benefit. And so the guidelines are set at this level, about 150 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. And that amount of physical activity gives you a hazard ratio for mortality of about 0.7, so about a 30% lower mortality risk. And um, that's what's reflected in um, um, physical activity guidelines around the world. I was involved in putting together the UK physical activity guidelines on the, on the, on the, on the um, right. On the left are the World Health Organization guidelines, which came out last year. The numbers are actually exactly the same. It's the same underlying pe data people, people are looking at. But there are, there are um, three components to the guideline, and I'm just going to talk about them briefly. So the first is undertaking at least 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity or half the amount of vigorous. So 75 minutes to 150 minutes. And um, so what does that mean? So broadly, moderate intensity physical activities are activities of three to six METs. One MET is resting metabolic rate. So if you're working at three METs, you're expending energy at three times the rate that you would expend it at rest. Um, that is broadly equivalent to walking at a comfortable pace. So four kilometers an hour, two and a half miles an hour or faster. And the broad rule of thumb for moderate intensity physical activity is if you're walking alongside with your friend, you can chat to them and hold a conversation, but you'd struggle to sing a song. Vigorous intensity activities are higher intensities, so more than six METs, more than six times resting metabolic rate. And you get to these intensities by walking uphill and running um, and things like that. And basically, it's characterized by you, you'd struggle to hold a fluid conversation when you are working, when you're working vigorously. So that's the part of the physical activity guidelines that most people know. What people, most people are less aware of is there's actually two other bits. So the first is doing muscle strengthening activities on at least two days of the week. And the third is to limit the amount of time you spend sitting down. And in my session yesterday, I talked about um, sitting down or sedentary behavior. So I'm not going to cover it today, but I'm going to talk about the aerobic activity and the muscle strengthening activity components of the guidelines now. So 
one of the things that we need to think about when we when we think about how much activity we need to do is how the how the data were collected. And what you find in the vast majority of the epidemiological data, like the first slide I showed you, looking at the dose response relationship between um, uh, physical activity and risk of adverse health outcomes, such as mortality or type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease, were based on questionnaire, self-reported questionnaire data for people's physical activity levels. So you ask people in, in a fairly in a moderately sophisticated way how physically active you are, and then people are followed up over time to look at their risk of adverse health outcomes. And, and what you find is if you um, um, met, um, ask people how physically active they are, you find that in, in, the, in the UK and US and um, um, a, a number of uh, high, high income countries, that about half of the population meet that, that component of the physical activity guidelines. But there's another way you can work out how physically active people are, and that's by using a device like a, an accelerometer. We all have them. So my, my watch at the moment counts my, counts my steps. Um, so it can measure my body's movements. And you can get slightly more sophisticated devices that are uh, accelerometer devices than the ones you'd buy, buy in the shop. And you can use them to, 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 to measure how much people are moving. And if you, if you do that, what you find is less than 10% of the population meet guidelines. So, Half the population say they meet the guidelines, but when you actually directly measure how much physical activity people do, about 10% do. So the question is, is this a really big problem? So it might not be as big a problem as you might initially think. Um, and I'm going to um, sh show you this with some, some data from a, a brilliant research fellow working with me called Carlos Celis Morales. So this is some work that he did um, in his PhD uh, um, uh, quite a long time ago. And what Carlos did in just over 300 people was he asked them how physically active they were using a, a questionnaire called the IPAC. This is uh, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. It's a well, well used questionnaire. Don't worry about the units. Basically, as you move along, more is higher. And measured their physical activity using an accelerometer device. And these are all the points. And what you would see is if people did the amount of activity they said they did, all the points would lie along this line, this, this 45 degree line. And what you find is they don't. They lie on a lower line. But it's not that people, so people over report how much they do. They, 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 they report doing more than they actually do. But there's also scatter here. So what we've got here is it's not that everybody's over reporting by a consistent amount. People are over reporting by an inconsistent amount. And the knock-on effect of that is um, something called regression dilution bias. So it means that the ability um, to detect a relationship between physical activity and risk of um, health outcomes is diminished. And we can see this here from these data. So what we've got here is your plasma triglyceride concentration and the amount of physical activity you're doing on, on the, on the, the x-axis. So people are divided into quartiles of physical activity. Q1 is the least active 25%. Q4, the most active 25%. And if we divide them into these quartiles of physical activity based on accelerometer measured physical activity, we get this nice re dose response relationship in that the more activity you do, the lower your triglycerides, which is, very, it is absolutely consistent with what we see in the lab when we, when we do this under controlled conditions. However, when you measure physical activity by self-reported questionnaire. We don't see this relationship at all. There's no statistically significant relationship between the two. So what we find is that when we don't measure physical activity well, we, we diminish the apparent association between physical activity and health outcomes. So if we go back to the original data, what we see uh, from the... Um, uh, um, uh, 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 epidemiology from a questionnaire-based physical activity, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity associated with a 30% lower risk of mortality, has the ratio of 0.7. And you get to the lowest possible risk of mortality doing about 500 minutes per week. Um, and there you've got a hazard ratio of about 0.6, so a 40% lower risk. Now, in recent years, there have been data which come out which um, have used accelerometers to measure people's actual physical activity and looked at the association with risk of mortality. So this is a, a meta-analysis um, which was published in the BMJ in 2019 with Ulf Eklund as the lead author. And what you've got on the, on the x-axis here is the amount of physical activity accelerometer measured in minutes per day 
y-axis is um, mortality hazard ratio. And what we see here is to get to a hazard ratio of 0.7, there's 30% lower risk. It's only five minutes per day or 35 minutes per week. And then if we look at the point where you get to the lowest possible risk, um, and here, uh, this doesn't really go up. If you look at the 95% confidence intervals, it, it, it's consistent with it just staying flat. Um, what we see is there's only about 20 minutes per day. And the reduction in risk is about 60%. So what we're seeing when you when you measure physical activity using an accelerometer is the amount you need to do to get a benefit is lower and the magnitude of the benefit is higher than we do when we look at self-report. And if we look at all our evidence and physical activity guidelines, they're generally based on self-report. Um, and this is something I wrote a commentary on um, um, last year in, in, in Nature Medicine. It's worth a read. It's only two pages long. But um, what, 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 what one of the conclusions was the benefit in terms of lowering a risk of mortality for an extra minute of accelerometer measured physical activity was equivalent to about two and a half minutes of self-reported physical activity. So the benefits of activity may be greater and the levels at which they occur may be lower than we previously thought. And I'm gonna show you an example of this. I talked about this study briefly yesterday. This is a study that, that we, we did with colleagues throughout Europe called Eurofit. And, and what we did in this particular study is take, take it, take, uh, we, 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 we try to get around this issue that men generally don't engage with lifestyle intervention. If you look at most of the large lifestyle intervention trials, um, the majority of participants are women. Men, men, men seem to be less bothered and particularly men at lower socioeconomic status, the lower socioeconomic classes seem to be less bothered. But one of the things that often men do is they love football and they've got a really, really strong affinity to the football club that they've, that they've supported since they were a child. So what we did is we leveraged this by taking top level football clubs throughout Europe. So clubs like um, Manchester City and Arsenal and um, Everton and Porto and Benfica and PSV Eindhoven. So, 15 clubs throughout Europe. And what we did is we, we recruited football fans who supported the clubs and we trained the coaches of the clubs to deliver a lifestyle intervention. We did a one-year intervention in about uh, 1,100, I think it was 1,113 men, randomised to either the intervention or not. Um, so this is some of the men, sort of they, they managed to go to the clubs where they, where they, where they support. And these are the men's, sort of men doing some of, the, some of the activities. We took a bunch of measurements in them and, 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 and what we found is when you looked at the amount of objectively measured physical activity that they did um, and how much it changed over 12 months, it only changed by about six minutes, which is a little bit disappointing. It was a six million euro project and we changed physical activity by six minutes a day. What we, what we did, though, is we, we changed their self-reported physical activity by about 32 minutes per day. So a clear thing is if you people are not very good at reporting how physically active they are. They're not very good at all. You have to measure it. But the key thing was, even though we changed physical activity by only about six minutes per day when we properly measured it using an accelerometer, it was enough to cause about a 2.6 kilogram reduction in body weight, um, a 1.2 millimeter reduction in, in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, reduction in insulin and insulin resistance, reduction in triglyceride, um, um, reduction in, in, in um, liver enzymes. So although the amount of physical activity is relatively small, we actually, it was enough to produce a reasonable amount of metabolic benefit. So the amount of objectively measured physical activity needed for, for substantial health benefits may be less large than we think, maybe only five to 10 minutes per day, but there are larger benefits of doing more. Now, the key thing here is this can change how we prescribe physical activity. Because telling somebody that's not very active, they need to do 30 minutes a day can seem daunting. But if we tell people you might only need to do seven or eight minutes a day, and you could do this by walking for two or three minutes, three or four times throughout the day, as long as you walk reasonably briskly, and that's enough, you might be more likely to get people to do it. So I think uh, evidence such as um, the, the, the work from the accelerometer uh, with the um, epidemiology and, and trials like Eurofit might change the way that we try and prescribe physical activity for inactive people going forward. And I think that's, a, I think that's a, something to, to watch this space for. And the next thing, which, um, which is really the forgotten part of the physical activity guidelines, is muscle strengthening activities. Most people can recall 
30 minutes of physical activity a day, 150 minutes per week, but almost zero people um, say that you need to do muscle strengthening activities twice a week. Why do we need to do muscle strengthening activities? Well, one is it helps with our physical function. We, um, we, we peak in muscle strength in our sort of early, early to mid-20s, and then it starts to decline. And if you're not very strong, you get to a point where as you get older, your strength falls below a capacity threshold. So you're not able to pick up the shopping. You're not able to get out of a chair. You can't cross the road fast enough before the man, red, man changes from green to red. Um, whereas if you're a bit stronger, you can actually follow this green line so you can actually keep function um, later in life. So that's the obvious reason why it's important to do strength training. The other thing that might be less obvious is there seems to be a metabolic benefit as well. So this is data from the Nurses Health and Nurses Health 2 study. Um, and what we've got on the y-axis is relative risk of type 2 diabetes and amounts of muscle strengthening activities. So none here up to 150 minutes per week. Uh, and, and, and moderate to vigorous aerobic activities here. And we see that doing more muscle strengthening activities and doing more aerobic activities are both associated with lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And there's also evidence in people who have type 2 diabetes and from randomized controlled trials, which shows that doing a combination of aerobic activity and resistance activity gives a bigger reduction in HbA1c than doing either aerobic or resistance activity um, on its own. And that's when you, the, the total volume is fixed. So you're doing the same total amount of activity, but you're splitting it between aerobic and resistance. You seem to get a bigger reduction in HbA1c than, uh, than doing either aerobic or resistance on its own. So it seems that aerobic and, and resistance exercise um, work via slightly different mechanisms. So you get an additive effect if you, if you do them together. The other thing that you might not be aware of is strength is a really, really important predictor of future health outcomes. So this is some data. Again, this is Carlos Celis Morales is the first author from UK Biobank, which is a large epidemiological study of, 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 of 500,000 people um, um, throughout, throughout the UK. And one of the things that these people did is that grip strength measured by this hand grip dynamometer that you can see the picture of there. Um, um, so grip strength in itself is probably not the most important thing, but it's easy to measure in large numbers of people. But we know that grip strength correlates really well with strength in other parts of the body. So, for example, people that have strong grip strength also have strong leg strength. So it's a measure of overall muscular strength. And what we find is that for every five kilogram lower grip strength, and to put this into perspective, I think men on average had grip strength about 35 kilograms, women about 25 you get about a 20% a, a um, increase in risk of mortality in women, 16% men. And you also get increases in risk of um, basically every single potential class of mortality. So being not being strong is um, a strong factor which influences risk of mortality. And what you find is if you take a, a risk score, so if you take an office-based risk score, uh, for 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality, taking into account age, smoking, BMI, sex, blood pressure, and diabetes, and you add in grip strength on top of that, you improve prediction. So the C-index increases by about the same amount as adding in HDL to, to measurement. So you actually get additional um, predictive power by adding in grip strength into the model over and above what, we've, what, we already, what we already measure normally. So the thing is, right, 50% of the population meet the guidelines for um, muscle strengthening activity, but only about 25% of the population meet the guidelines for, for, um, for um, muscle. So 50% for aerobic, only about 25% for muscle strengthening activities. So the question is, how little muscle strengthening activity can you get away with? And this is something that um, was we, 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 we looked at slightly in a, in a, in a BBC programme that was out, um, I think it was the start of this year, um, um the, the, the links there, you might still be able to see it. But, but basically, it's, 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 it's looking at work that we're currently doing in Glasgow, um, trying to say what's the minimum amount of, fit of a re um, resistance exercise that you need to, get to do to get a strength benefit. And if we show that, we can potentially use that to see whether you get a me metabolic benefit from that small amount of activity. And what we're doing is using, basing this on the idea that if you look at all the meta-analysis data for muscle strengthening activities and improvements in strength and, and muscle size, what you find is doing more gives you a bigger benefit, but it's not linear. The biggest benefit you get is going from zero sessions to one session a week. 
So you get about 70% of the benefit in muscular strength of doing four sessions a week of uh, resistance exercise with the first session that you do. And then if you look at sets of exercise, so often if you do exercise, you might do three sets of 10 reps or something like that. You get most of the benefit from the first set that you do as well. And the caveat with this is the set needs to be done to the point of fatigue. So if you're doing exercise like this, you, you do them until you can't lift the weight again. And if you do that, it actually doesn't matter how heavy the weight is within reason. So you do a heavier weight fewer times or a lighter weight more times. As long as you take it to the point where the muscle is fatigued and you can't do another rep, you get the same adaptation. So what we've done is said, well, we can get a bunch of exercises. And if you tell you, you've got about six major muscle groups in this body that you're interested in and looking at. So you've got, you know, shoulders, back, uh, shoulders, chest, back, um, core, um, uh, sort of your glutes and your, and your, and your, and your, and your, and your legs. What you can do is one exercise per week on each of those muscle groups. So let's say, for example, you chest and press ups. So you do press ups until you can't do any more press ups. And if you're not strong enough to do them on your feet, you do them on the knees or against the counter, um, which will take less than a minute in most people. If you can do a minute of press ups, you're very strong. So you can do that throughout the, the, the week, one minute per, per muscle group per week um, um, to the point of fatigue. And what we're doing at the moment is doing a study to see how much it changes strength. And if we see that, then it's something that you could potentially apply to people in the real world, because doing a minute per day, you don't need to get changed. Um, um, you can do it sort of just after you brush your teeth. It's not a big it's not a big deal. So so what we're trying to do is make resistance exercise a little bit more um, achievable um, to, to people, because often people think that going to the gym is something that they really they really don't want to do. Um, so. Um, muscle strengthening is important for health. Um, low strength is an important um, risk factor for adverse health outcomes. And, and one set per week per major muscle group might be enough. OK, I'm going to shift tack slightly to talk about fitness. So what I've talked so far, I've talked about strength, which is a biological trait. But physical activity is a behavior. So it's, it's how much your, your behavior of moving your muscles um, um, to, 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 to do work. There's a related biological trait called cardiorespiratory fitness, which is your body's ability to, to use oxygen. It's often measured as your VO2 max or maximal oxygen uptake. So someone who's fit cardiorespiratory um, can, can, can run fast for long periods of time. So if you're fast at running a 10K or running a marathon, you've got a high level of cardiorespiratory fitness. You improve your um, fitness by doing more physical activity, but there's an important genetic component to, to, to fitness. So about half of your VO2 max is explained by heritable factors. So how well you chose your parents influences how fit you're, you're likely to be. And so a question is, what's more important for health? Is it how much physical activity you do? So this behavior of being physically active or your level of cardiorespiratory fitness? So it turns out fitness is important in itself. So this is a, this is a, this is, um, a study that was done by Ulrich Wisloff and, and Lauren Koch. And what they did in this particular study was they took rats and they ran them on a treadmill and they ran them on a treadmill and they measured how good they were at running. And they took the rats that were really good at running and they bred them generation on generation on generation. So by 13 or 14 generations in, you've got these super rats that are really, really have high capacity. And then on the other end, you take the rats that were not very good at running and you breed them generation on generation on generation. So at the end, you get rats that got picked last in PE. These are the rats that are not very physically uh, able. And what you find is if you look at more risk of mortality, the low capacity rats in, in um, orange lived for about seven months shorter. And this is a long time in a rat which has a life expectancy of two years than the high capacity rats. So a higher level of fitness, being bred for a higher level of fitness, increased life expectancy. Turns out the same thing happens in humans too. So this is data from a fantastic study called the Copenhagen Male Study. And what they did in just over 5,000 men in the, in the 1970s, in, their, in middle age, in the mean age, about 48 when they did this, was do a fitness test. And then they followed them up for 46 years so nearly half a, half a century. And, and they looked at their risk of mortality. And what you can see here, this is the cumulative instance of mortality. And the, so the, the fittest men are in blue at the bottom and the least fit men are in red at the top. And you've got a difference in life expectancy of about 4.9 years between the fittest and the least fit men. 
So fitness in itself seems to be important. Now, one of the things that we did um, um, a few years ago was look in UK Biobank to see whether there was any interaction between how fit you are um, and how physically active you did you, you are in, in terms of risk of mortality. So what in, in UK Biobank, about 70,000 of the participants undertook a fitness test and we categorized them as having low, moderate, sorry, high, moderate or low levels of fitness uh, based on turtiles for age, for age and sex. So but you took people in five year bands, male and some females, and said, so if, if you're a man aged 50 to 54, um, are you in the top, middle or bottom third of the population? We did that across them. And then what and, and then what we've also got here is Q1 to Q, sorry, Q5 to Q1. So Q5 are the most active 20% of the population and Q1 are the least active. And what we see is if you take people who are in the bottom third of the population for fitness, um, if they are inactive, they've got a high risk of mortality. But even if their fitness is low, if they are active in the top 20% of the population, their risk of mortality is the same as people who have a high level of fitness. But when you take people that are highly fit, it doesn't matter how active they are. They're at low risk, even if they're inactive. So if you are um, genetically lucky enough to be naturally fit, it seems that you can probably get away with being, being inactive. Um, of course, a lot of people, once they become inactive, will move to these other categories. But if you can stay in this category here, you're, you're, you're likely to, to, be, um, to, be, to be protected. And, and we see the same story when we look at grip strength. So we can look at people's top, middle and bottom third of the population for grip strength. The people who are not strong and not active are at high risk. But when they become active, or, or um, it, 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 if, if they are active, their risk is the same as somebody that's strong. Whereas people that are strong, it's pretty flat apart from if they're in the bottom 20% of the population. They seem to be able to get away with being um, less active and seem to have low risk irrespective. So the benefits of physical activity on health outcomes are the greatest in people who have low fitness or low strength. And people with high fitness or high strength appear to be protected even if they're inactive. So the corollary of this is we need to get inactive people with low fitness and strength rather than all inactive people to become more active for public health. And this can be a challenge because people generally like doing things that they're good at. And people that have a low level of fitness or a low level of strength are probably less good at physically active type things. So they might enjoy them less. So there is the real challenge in, in what we need to do really to improve public health is to get the people who probably like being active the least to become most act to become more active if we're going to um, try and try try and um, reduce their, their, their um, um, improve public health. I'm just going to do a couple of quick slides on physical activity and obesity to finish off. So, so the first thing is there is a relationship between how physically active you are measured by an accelerometer and whatever index of uh, adiposity you like. So this instance is BMI. This is data from the uh, UK Biobank in both men and women, the people who report who, who have more measured physical activity using an accelerometer have a lower BMI than people with, 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 with um, uh, less physical activity. But one of the questions here is that's cross-sectional. And so is it that physical inactivity is leading to obesity or is it that obesity is leading to physical inactivity? And we can't tell those from those cross-sectional data. So um, we were able to, 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 to investigate this um, um, to some extent um, using data from the, the Navigator trial. And what happened in the Navigator trial is people had measurements of physical activity at serial times, and they also had measurements of um, weight at serial times. So we could actually, by looking at the time series, work out whether um, change, in, change in weight, sorry, uh, whether weight influenced um, step count in the, uh, in, in the future and, and whether change in weight increased step count and similarly whether step count in, influenced um, weight um, later on. And what we found, long story short, is the relationship was bidirectional. So physical activity or changes in, uh, was, was, was associated with changes in weight, but it was relatively small. So a 2,000 step um, difference in um, step count per day, which is equivalent to walking about 20 minutes more, was associated with about a 60 gram difference in weight at follow up. And a 10 kilogram difference in weight was associated 
with people doing less physical activity by about 220 steps, about two minutes less uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it appears that this relationship is bidirectional, but it's weak in both directions. So being physically inactive leads to an increase in body weight. Being heavier leads to a decrease in physical inactivity, but the relationship is relatively weak in both um, both parts. So final, final couple of slides. Is the relationship between physical activity and adiposity the same for everyone? So again, this is some data that we 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 did from UK Biobank, and what we did what we what we did is we 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 um, came up with a genetic profile risk score for obesity based on um, ninety three SNPs. So we took each SNP, looked which version they had, which are related to body weight, weighted them depending on how, what the effect they, they had was, and we divided people into quartiles for the genetic risk score for obesity. And then within that, we looked at how much physical activity they did. This is objectively measured physical activity. Um, so um, this is, I'm, I'm, I'll show you a slightly simpler version of the data here. So, so basically, if you are in the top 25% of the population for genetic risk versus the bottom 25%, you're about four kilograms heavier. So we see this dose response relationship. The more obesity genes you have, the heavier you are. But what you can do is say, if you take someone with a high genetic risk of obesity, in the bottom third of the population for weight, sorry, bottom third of the population for physical activity versus the top, they're about seven kilograms lighter. And you, but if you take someone with a low genetic risk of obesity and versus in the bottom versus the top, they're about five kilograms difference in weight. So what you find is the benefits of being more physically active on body weight are actually greatest in the people who have the highest genetic risk. So it, it's not that what, if you've if you got a genetic risk of obesity, people go, well, look, there's nothing I can do, doc. Um, it's my genes. Um, um, they're, they're making me fat and, and, and I can't do anything about it. What the data actually shows is the exact opposite, that if you've got genes which predispose you to obesity, how much physical activity you do seems to have a, a bigger association with your body weight than somebody who is lucky enough not to have genes which predispose them to obesity. And I'll just uh, finish off now by um, thanking all the people I've, um, I've, I've worked with um, over the years. So um, thank you very much. And I'd be delighted to take some questions in the discussion. Prof. Gail, thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. And I have to say, I did enjoy that uh, um, um, session in BBC Horizon um, <laughs> very much so. And actually, my patients enjoy it when I uh, direct them to do the one minute um, exercise stre uh, strength and exercise sessions. And, uh, and it's very, very empowering to patients. So uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, uh, it was really nice presentation. So um, uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, uh, while we're waiting, I can't see any questions. Can I, can I start, Prof. Uh, Bolton? Um, as you rightly said, um, um, we're expecting uh, a tsunami of uh, diabetes complication after the easing off of uh, um, the lockdown and hopefully returning back to normality. Um, so I'm, I'm asking you as the IDF uh, president right now, um, do you think the IDF have to take... Uh, a leading role in shaping uh, the worldwide response to this, because uh, obviously uh, we don't know what has been kept for two years uh, from uh, uh, from from the speci specialist care, really. So, wh what do you think, and how do you see the IDF response to this tsunami, or expected tsunami of uh, diabetes complications, Prof? Well, thank you very much. That's a, a very important question. Uh, we have 260 member associations across the world, and we're working with them. Uh, but also, the important is to get the message through to the health payers, the, the governments, the health departments, that diabetes is a serious condition. The prevalence is going to be even higher in the next atlas. The number of patients across the world, as I say, will be well over half a billion. And this is always an underestimate. So the most important message to governments at large is that diabetes is a, a very expensive disease. The complications are very expensive, but there is great potential for prevention early on by screening high risk people. And as the last speaker in his very entertaining talk talked about the involvement in exercise. And this is so important. So screening and taking important uh, 
diabetes as a serious condition. Why do people have a prostate check or a mammography? Because they're frightened of cancer. Why do people take a statin? They don't feel any better, but they're frightened of heart disease. But diabetes touches sugar. My grandmother had it. She was 90. So we've got to remove that sort of public opinion that diabetes is not a serious disease. And that's what we're working on. But having listened to the last talk, I'll make three comments. <laughs> First of all, I felt very guilty. I thought I'd check my phone. To I've, I've done 11,000 steps, so I felt less guilty. But another study for, for Jason, being a, a church bell ringer, a campanologist, I'll be swinging heavy bells tomorrow morning. And that would be a great study. People always like new studies for, for muscle strengthening. Uh, and thirdly, delighted you looked at Manchester City supporters and not Celtic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll probably take another question. Let me see if we have any. Um, Jason, I, we don't have any questions, but I have one for you, if that's all right. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, your efforts, uh, your, your involvement with uh, the public through TV and other uh, venues uh, is, is quite important. Uh, so how do you see the impact of, uh, of uh, popularizing uh, um, exercise and the science behind exercise? Uh, uh, would that have a positive impact on, uh, on people uptake of exercise? And uh, just to take it a step further, has this been measured? Has your group, have you measured the impact of popularizing exercise and the science behind exercise have you have you done that before so, so that's a very interesting point um so we have so the short answer is we haven't measured the the effects of this um I mean, it's something i think is important because it, it's some it's well there's two things one is i'm interested in the popularization of science and the science of physical activity and diet is something that people can relate to um and you, you, you can actually sneak it in. You can sneak in quite a lot of science into a popular program. And one of the things that I've been doing this for a long, long time, one of the, I started off, I kind of wanted to do the very straight down the line science programs. And then what well, some of the producers told me, well, if you do those, a, a million people will watch because not very many people want to watch science programs. So if you can try and make it more entertaining and do these stunts, right, you'll get three or four million people to watch. And you kind of sneak the science in. So I've become more comfortable on doing things which uh, are things that are really outside my comfort zone as I'm a proper scientist, I guess, um, to try to, 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 which actually gets more. So one example is we did a program on diabetes remission uh, where what we did is we essentially, it was called Diabetes, the Fast Fix. It was a two-part series on ITV. And what we did, and we didn't have to do it this way, and I was pushing against it, but I'm glad they, we overruled, is that with direct, they kind of put people on an 800-calorie diet for a number of weeks and half the people got into remission. So we, we replicated that, but we did a sort of a big brother house where we got five people into the house and they kind of went these diets and you saw how they interacted and they got little crabby. And then what happens, we got three out of five of them into, well, remission over the time period. But what happened is loads of people watched. It was the most watched TV program at the time. And Diabetes UK had more people get in contact with them after that program than they ever had before. Um, and all these people that weren't aware, it was, in the, it was published in the, in the Lancer, scientists knew about it, people with diabetes didn't. Um, and so I think these sorts of things are quite important. But what we have to do with these is be very careful that what we present actually reflects the truth of the science. And sometimes you get slightly wacky people doing things which aren't reflected in science. So what I, what I try to do in, on these programs is make sure you do things in a stunt, but there's always a study behind so you kind of know what the real answer real answer should be. So I think that's quite important. And it's something that I, 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 I take quite seriously, even though it looks like it's fun. Thank you very much. I have a, a question for you, Prof. Bolton. Um, so the question says, what's uh, the best treatment agent for diabetes in case of COVID-19, either in hospital or for our patients? Well, for, the, for, for patients who are at risk of, de of developing COVID, which is all of us, if you have diabetes, the good control is however it can be achieved uh, if you're an outpatient living at home. So it, it doesn't matter what medications you use, it's the achieving stable, reasonable glycemic control. In hospital, it's different. Uh, and I think most people in hospital, we, we now strive to get good control early on because of the data I've showed, shared with you, especially those with time above range and so on. So it's usually insulin, usually insulin. And, in, and obviously in ICU, it's often insulin infusion. Thank you. 
Right, great. It has been a fantastic session. Uh, it remains for me to uh, uh, thank uh, our board speakers, Professor Bolton, uh, Professor Jason Gill, for the fantastic contribution to this year's Gates uh, uh, meeting, and thank all, uh, all of you for your attendance. And uh, we'll hand over to the next uh, session. Thank you very much.